Welcome to the Virtual Mind Walk series hosted by the Central Coast State Parks Association and California State Parks. My name is Monica. I'm going to be the moderator today. I'm with the Central Coast State Parks Association. Let me make sure I have my thing pulled up here. We're going to have an awesome presentation today, everyone. So glad you're all here. And I know we're expecting a lot more. Um, just a couple things before we get started. Most of you are probably familiar with the Virtual Mind Walk series, but at the bottom of your screen, there are a few options. There's the chat option and the Q&A option. If you come up with any questions during today's program, you can type them there and um, I'll keep an eye on those. And after uh, the presentation, we can go over um, the questions that are in there as time allows. So feel free, uh, excuse me, feel free to type those in there as, um, the presentation goes on and we'll get to those at the end of today. Alrighty, I'm going to go ahead and do the introductions. Looks like we've got a few more people logged in. Hi, everybody. Alrighty, well, today's virtual mind walk is titled Dark Skies Over the Central Coast. It's going to be awesome. We have Dr. John Keller here, and he is the director of Fisk Planetarium and a faculty member in astrophysical and planetary sciences at the University of Colorado Boulder. Prior to this position, Keller was a professor in the physics department at Cal Poly, he was one of my professors, <laughs> and helped to run SESAME, the Center for Engineering, Science, and Mathematics Education. Dr. Keller received his PhD in planetary science from the University of Arizona Lunar and Planetary Laboratory, where he conducted research involving both gamma ray spectroscopy as well as astronomy education research into student misconceptions about the greenhouse effect. Keller also has extensive experience in K-12 STEM teacher prep and runs an NSF-funded citizen science research effort involving teachers and students from 40 communities across the rural western U.S. collecting telescope data to measure trans-Neptunian objects in the outer solar system. So cool, so lucky to have him here today. Thanks everyone for joining. Again, questions in the chat or Q&A. And uh, go ahead, Dr. Keller, I'll be in the background, take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it, Monica, for all of your support and for inviting me to this opportunity. Um, I am uh, I'm calling you from Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm actually not in either Colorado or in California. Um, I came out here for the 17 years cicada bloom, um, which is happens every 17 years with cicadas going crazy across the East Coast. Um, and also my niece's graduation from high school, which is probably a better reason to actually be out here. Um, but yes, I really encourage lots of questions, um, interactions. I'm sorry I can't actually see your faces, uh, but if you have any questions or thoughts, feel free to shoot them into the chat or the Q&A section. Um, I'm happy to make this as interactive as we can using that functionality. Uh, as Monica mentioned, I um, was in San Luis Obispo uh, at Cal Poly for 10 years. Uh, super miss it. Um, so for those of you who I know out there, I like including especially Dr. Fry, um, great to, uh, great to you know, virtually be back with you. Um, but when Monica reached out to me, I was and asked, like, did I want to give a talk about anything? I wanted to basically, like, of, of the, I pointed her to several of the geologists and other folks at Cal Poly to give talks about Morro Bay, um, but wanted to just spend some time talking about dark skies. And really, I've come to appreciate well, with all the great things that are currently happening in my world in Boulder, Colorado now, like one, one of the things I miss the most about San Luis Obispo is just the dark central coast skies. And so today's talk is um, really uh, largely about light pollution, about dark skies and the importance and preservation of those. Um, and so it will uh, lift heavily from materials that I've taken from the International Dark Sky Association. Um, and I'm happy to uh, answer questions, talk about questions, ask questions um, about, about dark skies over the Central Coast. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, with the slides that I wanted to share. Um, so here uh, is the nature tree packet um, from the Dark Sky Association um, on dark skies. Um, as you all know, we live in a pretty amazing universe, uh, you know, a hundred billion to more 200 billion to almost a trillion stars in our galaxy, hundred billion galaxies to almost a trillion galaxies in the universe. Um, and we are down here on this little planet called Earth, spinning around 23 hours and 56 minutes per day uh, as we go around the sun. And we get to actually look up during the daytime and see amazing atmospheric phenomenon and solar phenomenon. 
and we get to look up in the nighttime and see that universe that we are a small but important part of. This is a picture taken over Arches National Monument um, by one of my colleagues at Boulder. Um, on that planet, we have continents uh, and we have oceanic crust that has water above it. Um, and um, these the next three slides are pictures taken. Uh, these are actually mosaic, mosaic photographs using NASA and NOAA data from our Earth observing system, which is a very solid you know, system of uh, satellites that orbit the Earth, um, taken uh, on, on nighttime, taken over the course of many nights to show just kind of the extent of what our globe looks like from the backside um, during the nighttime. And so you can see here a distinct outline of North America, the United States in particular, the Eastern United States and Washington DC in particular. Um, you can also see the coastal regions of South America, um, Brazil and Peru and Ecuador. Um, and that is the, you know, our, our side of the globe spinning around. We can, you know, we, we can distinctly see the presence of human civilization on the Nile, um, on the coast of Africa, all throughout Europe. Um, and into Scandinavia, over into the Middle East and India, over on the right-hand side. Um, and again, we stand out very clearly wherever there are lots of humans, we stand out very clearly with, with uh, you know, imprints of lights that is, is related to our civilization that is being projected up into the sky. Um, this is a zoom in onto that map of the United States. Uh, here is uh, uh, Denver, Denver and, and Colorado Springs and Fort Collins and where I currently live. Uh, here's Los Angeles and San Francisco. The Bay Area stands out nicely there. Um, and then the central coast of California, the Big Sur coast from Monterey down to where you all are. Um, and uh, I grew up in Idaho, so I grew up here in Boise, uh, Boise, Idaho. My brother lives in Portland. You can basically see all of the cities and locations, uh, Phoenix, Tucson, Las Vegas, they all stand out very, very clearly because that's where people live and that's where people shine their lights in the nighttime and a lot of that light going up into the sky creates uh, what we know as light pollution. Um, but importantly, on the central coast where you all live, uh, you have relatively darker skies than other parts of our country. Um, this is from the National World Atlas of Dark Sky. I made that up, sorry. This is from the World Atlas on, on, on artificial light pollution um, that shows a global map of the densest uh, light pollution areas up in the Northeast and over in Europe um, and the darkest places um, in the Amazon, throughout Africa, in the outback of Australia. Um, and there's the Central Coast, even, you know, still standing out here is like blue, not black, but you know, not, not yellow or, or red. Um, and, uh, and then to zoom in on, this is actually a, this is, a, yeah, it's a light, it's a light map of the, of the brightest parts of, of North America. Um, and then, you know, this, this really distinct line here is really fascinating. Like they, that's actually, I, I believe that's, well, I don't know what that's about, but I, I think it could be related to aquifers and where you have enough water for large populations of people to hang out and have and have um, larger cities and um, agriculture and larger population densities. Um, this is changing. So this is a um, estimate of brightness over um, from the 1950s up until a projection of 2025. So this is 75 years of growth of sky brightness. Um, and you can see, you know, basically just increasing, ever increasing population density. Um, and then uh, in addition, lighting, lighting density on the planet. I do not know if this actually has incorporated into the model, the invention or the invention, the, the mass production of LED light bulbs and how that has affected that. That would be an interesting question to explore further. But you can basically, important part of the graph is of this chart is to show that we do see, you know, increases in the amount of lighting across our across our nation. Um, and so, specifically, we just want to talk a little bit. So that, that's you know that's looking down on the Earth and seeing the light that's coming up. I want to talk a little bit about what the effects of light pollution are for us down here, living um, in brighter and less bright areas. Um, this is looking over Los Angeles. Uh, we have three main kind of 
uh, subtleties of light pollution. One of those forms of light pollution is called sky glow. And so this is basically just glow from overall city lights of lots and lots of lights in a city area, creating these dome effects where you can see clearly that, you know, Milky Way and stars up in the upper left, but the glow from a city off here um, to the lower right, which is making it harder to notice the stars, the dimmer stars, the fainter stars, and definitely the Milky Way if the Milky Way had been there. Um, and so sky glow is limiting the brightness of well, the ability or contrast of being able to see stars um, in brighter areas versus darker areas. Uh, the National Park Service, uh, Go Parks, this is national, not state, but still a park nonetheless, um, has been a great advocate for promoting dark skies because national parks have recognized that they are oftentimes in places that have less people and therefore less light. And so they actually are a place you can go to to recapture the night and still see the nighttime sky. So here's a series of pictures taken um, with uh, various all sky camera equipment that um, my friend Ashley Pipkin at the National Park Service and other folks working there work with. You can see the Milky Way galaxy here. You can see you know, stars, bright stars in the sky and you know, darkness overhead. Um, and then you can also see the down here in the horizon, these brighter patches, which are coming from the horizon and then they've, they've deconvolved the sky out of the image just to show the, the estimated artificial sky glow um, in this particular region of Chaco Canyon, uh, Chaco Cultural Center, um, actually Chaco Culture National Historical Park um, in Northwestern New Mexico. Um, and what you're seeing here is basically just the light pollution from Albuquerque, uh, from Santa Fe, from other locations um, around New Mexico, around Chaco Canyon, where, and actually I apologize, I don't know which of these is Albuquerque and which is Santa Fe, but one of them is one and the other is the other and the other are other cities. But that's the sky glow coming from those communities surrounding Chaco. Um, here is the sky glow from a place close to you guys' home, Channel Islands National Park. So we're off, on the, we're off on the Pacific Ocean, we're looking out back towards Ventura and Los Angeles and Southern, you know, the big cities of LA and um, also this other location to the north of there. Uh, and I, I apologize again, I don't know exactly which location this is that is causing that sky glow, but this is the sky glow from Los Angeles. And clearly no Milky Way, right? No Milky Way to really show up here in the all sky picture, except for maybe right there. Uh, and then finally, this is probably one of the darker, it's not the darkest national park, but it's a darker one. Uh, this is Death Valley National Park out by Racetrack Playa, which is where the stones move around uh, based upon wind floating on ice rafts. Um, but the Milky Way stands out well, and this is the sky go coming from Las Vegas. Um, so we have, um, we have this issue of, uh, of sky glow, important for astronomy, right? Because you don't, you, you can see Orion right here in this picture. You cannot see Orion in this picture. Um, just because the contrast of the artificial lights makes it very difficult to see fainter and fainter stars. Um, another direct consequence of, of light pollution is glare, um, just the actual you know, direct light going directly in your eyes as you're walking underneath a city street lamp um, or next to a football field or a large shopping center. And we'll talk more about some of the human impacts and, and other effects of glare of the light going directly into your eyes, but that is another form of light pollution in addition to sky glow. Um, and then also light trespass. Um, and this is, um, this is just the idea that, you know, well, in, in America, we're really big about our property. We like to define our property as the stuff that we own or that we rent or that we, you know, where this is my fence and this is your fence. And we actually have pretty strict uh, kind of, not strict, we have very, we have these, ideas about ownership and like what's mine and where I should be and where I shouldn't be and trespassing someone's property. But we rarely think about light trespassing my property. Um, I can't tell you how I, I, when I first moved from San Luis Obispo out to Colorado, I moved up into the mountains for the first half a year. And then I moved back down into Louisville, which is outside of Boulder, Colorado. Um, and it's every single day, every single night, like just the light coming into my window from other people's houses, uh, from the neighborhood where I am, just that that's a thing, right? Because that's light that's actually coming into your space um, or into a space uh, as the light is not being contained within 
one location, it's being spread out and, and trespassing, if you will, into other, into other spaces where it may or may not actually be wanted or desired. Um, I think, and so just as an example of that, this is an example of both glare and light trespassing. Uh, if you lived in this neighborhood across the street from this house and they had a very, very light, you know, super bright light shining, you would create both glare and light trespassing. If you could simply shield that or turn that light off, in this, in this case, they've turned off that bright light, then you get rid of that trespass, that glare, and you don't get rid of the sky glow from the city, but you do get to see more of the sky without that bright light shining at you. I think, Monica, I should stop right there um, and just ask if there are questions. Um, I haven't, I apologize, I haven't been monitoring the chat, but, and Monica- Oh, that's, that's my job, that's okay. <laughs> you stop me at any, any point, but, but are there any questions or thoughts people would like to talk about here before we talk about some of the consequences, impacts, and then solutions to light pollution? I'm not seeing any at the moment, but if we want to give like 30, 45 seconds for people to type it out, but otherwise it is totally up to you. I'll let you know if I see any. Okay. Yeah. And I encourage people just to type them at any time. I'm happy to, to stop and talk more. Um, some of the consequences of, of why we care about these about about those three effects of light pollution um there are definitely measurable monitored and well-known ecological impacts of light pollution simple examples to that um, there are sea turtles that um, come out on full moon nights and they use the moon and the reflection of the moonlight off of the ocean glimmering on the ocean as a guide of both how to get away from the ocean to lay eggs and how to get back to the ocean after eggs have been laid um, there is lots of evidence that shows that on, on more lit beaches, uh, sea turtles get confused by the lighting on the shoreline and confuse that with the moonlight and continue traveling towards the non, the non ocean shores where the lights are. And that causes significant issues for their, um, well, for the mortality, frankly. Um, and so, uh, you know, misnavigating and getting confused about navigation in nocturnal settings, if we have artificial light causing different landscape scenes that, that these and that and the sea turtles in this case have not been adapted to or evolved to, uh, to be in their environment. So that's one ecological impact for animals. Um, in this case, sea turtles getting confused by light. Um, birds. For one second, I'm sorry. Yeah, sure, sure. We still have one question, and if you want to wait till um, later to answer it, but um, are there local laws in cities restricting neighborhood light trespass? Yeah, that's an awesome question, Judy. Thanks so much. Um, that is, there are, there are as across, it, this is city by city, right? And so there are definitely cities, not all, but, but many and growing numbers of cities that have been passing light ordinances, um, ordinances that place more guidance, both for, largely for home builders, frankly, for like, uh, for um, contracting companies and companies that are, that are building homes and building commercial and, and uh, private real estate to have guidelines to better guide those issues of glare and light trespass and amount and, and brightness of lighting. Um, it is city by city uh, or county by county it is largely not state by state and is definitely not federal. Um, and so that is something where locally people can be active um, to talk to city councils and to, to be conscious and aware of what those ordinances are and how, how they can be implemented and adapted um, from location to location. Awesome question. Um, talking a little bit more about animals. Um, birds are a significant sufferer of light pollution. It's estimated that um, hundreds of millions of birds per year uh, are affected by smashing into buildings and other, um, and other being affected by the glare from the light. Uh, and um, so many, many effects for birds. One is that uh, birds often, there are definitely birds that navigate with starlight um, I had the opportunity to go to Kearney, Nebraska three, three months ago, um, which is outside of Denver. Um, and in Kearney, Nebraska, there were actually half a, there were half a million 
sandhill cranes, right? 500,000 sandhill cranes all flying through this one little three, three mile patch of the Platte River. Um, and those, they, they all came in at twilight and nested during the evening and hung out together. And they all took off all in mass um, right as astronomical twilight, right as civil twilight was, was starting in the morning. Um, and those birds and many other birds navigate by stars. And so having less, having more sky glow and less sensitivity to the stars can be an effect for navigation. More importantly though, glare from lighting will affect the ability for birds to see buildings and other structures because of that glare that they're seeing. And so hundreds of thousands or millions of birds will smash into buildings and die from those impacts and collisions because of being disoriented in the nighttime by the glare and not seeing the objects around the glare. Um, and then finally, there's, uh, there are birds that, um, that will be drawn into the light, but then once they're in the light, they'll be more hesitant to fly out of the light. And there's a lot of predation, predator, prey things that go on in more light polluted areas than less light polluted areas that are again affecting the environment that these animals will, um, are, are adapted to work in. Um, I will stop there because I know several other great questions have been coming in. So let's look at those for a second. Um, how technical complex expansive is the system used by the National Park Service to monitor and qualify Skyglow? It's an awesome question, Scott. There's actually an entire, there's a protocol that you can go to on the National Park Service. If you type in, type in National Park Service uh, Dark Skies, there's a protocol that they've been using at all of their parks, which are all standardized. Um, using these all sky cameras um, and processing the data from those cameras to get the types of maps that we were looking at. Uh, they're related and similar to uh, what the Dark Skies Association uses in terms of light meters and handheld light meters and other cell phone camera apps that you can use, but, they're, but in the case of the National Park Service, they're using a standardized tripod and an all sky camera system to try to, to, try to actually monitor over time Part one of their goals is to monitor over time how sky glow is changing in their locations. Um, so it's a, it's a fairly, um, I don't know if that's enough of an answer, but it, they, are, they are making efforts to be standardized in that, in that data collection. Um, a question about whether light pollution adversely affects owls and other night hunters. Uh, yeah, exactly. So that's, um, it is, it's completely an impact on nocturnal animals and predators as well as prey that are, um, that are affected by, by the light pollution. Um, and then Tom, we will talk a little bit more about LEDs um, a little bit later on uh, and the impact of those, uh, of the LED color palette and other things for LEDs um, towards the end when we're talking about uh, ways to address light pollution. Thanks for the question though. Um, so we have another crazy effect, like light pollution also affects plants, not just animals. If you take a look at this picture, uh, you can probably puzzle this together, but here is a tree that has leaves on this part of the tree. Sorry, it does not have leaves. <laughs> I, can, I can do this, Monica. Not leaves up here, definitely leaves down there. And you may say to yourself, why does that tree have more leaves on the left-hand side than up there? Um, and it is actually because of this light. Um, this is an artificial light that is closest to this part of the tree. And because this light is on all night long, these, this part of the tree is getting more photons. And so as you come from spring into summer and you're saying, I'm a tree, is it spring or summer? Should I come out of my wintertime hibernation and make leaves? If you have artificial light, these trees will actually leaf earlier and then they will also lose their leaves later. So in this lower picture here, we have you know, fall colors of this tree, greenish colors here underneath this artificial light. So the artificial light is extending the uh, length of, of leafing for trees um, directly and localized around areas uh, that the artificial light is shining on them. Um, that, some may say, well, that's great because you get to spend more time, uh, you know, with your leaves out, but you actually don't want your leaves out if it starts to snow on you. And if you have extra leafing that you didn't lose because you still thought it was summer, that can cause additional problems. And there's studies that show that, that there are, you know, the, the length of the, the tree life of trees that live underneath these types of artificial lights is, is diminished by having those, that artificial um, 
in fact. There um, is also the issue of energy usage. And we have, um, we have, this is state data collected by the International Dark Sky Association or compiled by the IDA. Um, an estimate that roughly three to seven billion dollars of energy expenses is being spent on light that's being wasted by the light not being directed properly downwards and the light going upwards and being lost to what it was being used for. And so if you can actually, if you could recapture that and be more thoughtful about the amount and the direction of the light that you're putting down onto the ground, you could save up to up to $7 billion nationally um, every year. These are annual, annual numbers. Um, that is equivalent to 21 million tons of CO2 that again uh, is needed for that light that is not being used um, if, if we're not directing the light into specific areas. Um, and then with regards to humans, humans are animals too, um, but we are clearly affected by light pollution. Uh, having extra light affects levels of, of melatonin in the human body. Melatonin is a regulator for sleep cycles and your circadian rhythms. And so uh, it's very clear evidence that, you know, known evidence that having a stray light and extra lights that are on 24 hours, not 24 hours, at least in the middle of the night, will affect sleep cycles. Um, there's also, um, and I think you've all experienced this, right? You know, you, you go into a you go into a hotel in Los Angeles, and not only is there the extra lights from the outside, there's also the lights inside of the hotel room. But if you, I have a colleague who I work with on Recon, on our citizen science project, and every time he goes into a hotel, he actually goes around and actually puts black electrical tape on all of the extra appliances that are in the hotel room that are confusing and distracting to him in that environment. That's a very subtle form of light pollution. Uh, we're definitely talking more about the overall sky glow types of light pollution, but having having lights uh, on late into the night can cause significant issues for sleep cycles. There's also some uh, tentative evidence. There is debate about this still, but there's evidence that light pollution may actually have an impact on various forms of cancer. Um, I believe, I mean, part of the issue is that there's a lot of questions about correlations. Uh, you know, is it a correlative? that places that have more light pollution also may have other environmental factors in addition to the light that's causing, um, that's causing issues with cancer. Um, but, that, and, but, but this is still an active area of research. It is possible that those cycles and your immune system and your ability to, to address issues like cancer may be affected by the amount of lighting. Um, it is also true that it will, I mean, this is a great example of something you should not do, even though we all do it, and I know we do it, but this is our own little personal forms of light pollution. You know, watching, watching your screen or your device right before going to bed is definitely messing with uh, the natural cycles of your brain and nervous system um, and melatonin levels. And so if you can all, if you can at all set up a system where you don't do this, uh, that is clearly a good thing to try. Um, one last piece of things of where light pollution is in fact having negative consequences is frankly, it's, it's, a, it's just, we have, it's, it's part of the heritage of many, many cultures, many ancient cultures extending all the way up until the industrial revolution, where the sky was a very, very central part of the cultural heritage of that, of that, of that group of individuals. Um, Chaco Canyon has a long history of, of sky watching and, and archaeoastronomy, ancient astronomy, um, evidence that the, that the ancestral Pueblan of 1000 and earlier AD were using the sky for, 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 for many, many cultural purposes. We don't have that as much nowadays um, in Los Angeles and other places where you don't get to see the sky. And so um, I used to teach at Astro Camp up above Los Angeles in Idlewild, and we would have students coming up from LA, and they would get up to Idlewild, which still wasn't perfectly, like it was still, there was still light pollution from the surrounding, from Palm Springs and whatnot, but they were far enough from the sky, from, from LA, that they could actually see that there were stars in the sky, because many of those students had only ever seen airplanes and the moon, and maybe an occasional planet up in the sky um, and had never seen other, and never actually seen stars 
or and definitely had never seen the Milky Way. And so if you can't see the sky to use it as a guide and to have a part of cultural heritage, that knowledge and that use of the sky changes the perspective that we have in the universe that we live in. Um, one, and sorry, I, I will pause in a second for questions, uh, but uh, one question that oftentimes comes up in these conversations about light pollution is, but isn't it better to have more light? Like, isn't, isn't lighting an important safety consideration? Um, and, and it is a very real, I totally want to respect the fact that, you know, you want to feel safe in the middle of the night. And so one of the natural thoughts is, well, let's get more lighting because if there's more lighting, then I'll be able to see things and I'll feel safer. Um, while that can be true in some cases, it can also be the opposite, especially if you're dealing with glare. And so this is a picture that shows a couple of things and you probably immediately notice the light that was shining in the camera of the, of the, of the camera that was used to take the photograph. And you can clearly see the building that is being lit by that light that's shining directly into the camera. But you may not have noticed the person standing here um, in the open fence uh, that is away from that glare. And so by simply covering up the light and getting rid of the glare, you can notice here, individual standing here with light that makes that individual invisible or very difficult to see. And without glare, clearly we could see that person. Now you need some light shining in order to see somebody else there, but you don't need the light shining into your eyes. And you definitely don't need the light shining up because they, there's nobody up here. Well, there could be, I guess, but nominally we, we want the lighting to be directed not in our eyes, but down on the ground so that we can see the other things that we want to see. So it's all about the type of lighting design that you use, not just having lights all over the place. Um, so actually, I think I should pause there, Mer uh, Monica. Uh, before I continue for the last couple of slides that I have put together. Um, Tom, I'm going to hold off on your LED question a little bit longer, but um, any other uh, things that we would, people would like to discuss about kind of some of the effects of light pollution? Yeah, feel free everyone to use the chat or Q&A box at the bottom of your screen for any questions. I'm loving this so far, by the way. This is awesome. Learning a lot. I'll do an aside that this is the supermassive black hole instead of M87, um, a galaxy in the Virgo cluster. So that's an actual, it's, it's a polarimetry picture that shows the magnetic field lines coming off of the supermassive black hole accretion disk. So a little bit of extra side fun. Um, and I also want to emphasize as people are typing questions, like what's really great about the Central Coast is you have you have a good place. You have a place that has much less lighting than a lot of other um, parts of, of the United States and, and the world. So I guess I would encourage you to appreciate that as much as you can uh, every night um, and also to try to preserve it. All right, Monica, I will, I'll continue on. Um, but again, please don't hesitate to ask additional questions. Sounds good. Now I just have to find my slides again. <laughs> All right, so we had that great question about how standardized is the light meter detection being used by the National Park Service. Again, they have a protocol system. Uh, there are other personal um, systems that you can participate in. And um, if you're a teacher, you can have students participate in. I do this with my college kids every year, both at Cal Poly. Actually, maybe you, Monica, you may have had this as an opportunity to do in your class. Uh, we, uh, we have ways in which you can monitor how dark your skies are. There's a great citizen science project called Globe at Night that has both a technological and an eyeball, naked eyeball version of how you can measure the darkness of the skies. Um, and I'll show you that website in a second. Uh, but you can then report and uh, you can measure, make a local measurement from a location wherever you are wanting to make that measurement and upload it and crowdsource a map of sky brightnesses in people's areas. That can be used on using a sky meter, which can be purchased online from places like the International Dark Sky Association and other, other commercial providers. Um, and that's using a sky meter that gives you a measurement in terms of lumens or, or um, 
uh, brightness units within an area. And let's talk just a little bit about globe at night and the way you can do this with your naked eye. Um, I wanted to stop sharing this and to share the globe at night website, which is, that's Chrome, which is right here. Um, so this is what some of that data looks like uh, for the most recent year, I believe. Um, this, this is a map of the United States. All of these little dots are individual measurements or compiled aggregated measurements that, in, that uh, groups of people have made across the United States. Um, darker, uh, sorry, darker colors means the limiting magnitude is larger, meaning that the dimmer stars are more visible. Um, little astronomy for those of you who aren't astronomers, uh, the magnitude system increases with uh, diminishing brightness. So magnitude one, two, and three stars are brighter than magnitude five, six, and seven stars. And so if you live in a darker location, you can see down to seventh magnitude stars, which are the faintest stars. Uh, really, humans are best at seeing fifth and sixth magnitude stars. Uh, but um, but uh, in a brighter sky like Los Angeles, you're not going to be able to see anything you know fainter than a magnitude one or a magnitude two star. If we zoom into these locations, um, we get we can see these measurements being made down here in Los Angeles and San Diego, where you see more yellowish colors, and then more darker colors around the Central Coast, and then up in the Bay Area, you're getting to brighter colors. And just zooming in like a little bit for this to load but you can see these are individual measurements that people have made and submitted to globe at night um and it's just showing that in downtown san luis obispo the limiting magnitudes are uh are brighter limiting magnitudes because there's more light in san luis obispo and in places like cambria and outside in the wineries outside of templeton we have uh we have darker skies with larger limiting magnitudes um, some and then you have I mean you have conflicts right here because because not I mean not conflicts like these are measurements being made by individuals so in this case we have a, a limited magnitude of seven and a limited magnitude of one <laughs> right next to each other so there can be some inconsistencies in the measurements but it is it is an opportunity to participate in in local monitoring of your sky brightness uh, the way that this is done without a light meter is to go out on it's to go out and to look at a constellation like Orion. Uh, there are stars of all brightnesses in Orion, and you're given a map if you go to the Globe at Night website. And it says if you can see these five stars, but only those five stars, those are the five brightest stars in Orion, and so your limiting magnitude is one or two. If you can see these five stars plus these other seven fainter stars, then your limiting magnitude is is dimmer, is, is, is you know closer to limiting magnitude of four. And if you can see these 11 stars plus another 26 stars that all make up Orion all the way down to sixth and seventh magnitude stars, then you have a limited magnitude that is for a darker sky site. Uh, one other note for this globe at night project it is important to do this on non, non moonlit nights. And so uh, they ask that you do these, this self monitoring around new moon, new moon phases uh, when the moon is not up in the sky because clearly the moon is, can be a form of light pollution towards stars, even though it's a natural, uh, natural source of light. I guess you could call the sun a form of light pollution too, um, but you know, we like the sun and the moon. Um, and so, but you wanna make these measurements when the sun and the moon are not in the sky, so you can actually get the, the limiting magnitude without those two extra bright sources. Um, all right, and I, now I'm, now I'm going to go back to here uh, to again to share. That's one way that you can measure your own skies. Um, and again, I think that you are some of the lucky ones. Um, it turns out that only two out of ten people, twenty percent of the world's population, live in places when they, when they are when they are looking at the sky from wherever they live that they can see the Milky Way. 80% of the world's population cannot see the Milky Way from their backyard or from their, from, from their local place of residence. 
Uh, in the United States, 99% of people in the United States and Europe live under light polluted skies. And you know there is some light pollution in the central coast, but there is less than in other locations. Um, this is a great side story. This is Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles. And many of you may have heard this story. Uh, I apologize if you already have heard it too many times, but it's a great story to continue to tell. We had the we had the earthquake in Los Angeles back in the what was that was that the I guess the 90s sorry no Loma oh my gosh no I'm I'm gonna get my earthquakes wrong I've left California too much uh, Northridge the Northridge earthquake um, and there were large city blocks of Los Angeles that lost power as a result of the Northridge earthquake and many people went outside which was good because there had been an earthquake and you didn't want to necessarily be inside your your house, but a lot. So a lot of people went out and cap, camped outside of their houses um, the night of the earthquake. And there were reports all over the city of UFOs and aliens and all types of weird things in the sky that they'd never, the individuals from Northridge and Los Angeles had never seen because without the power and without the blocks being lit by light, people in Los Angeles could see the sky. And so all of a sudden the sky that was always there was now visible, but they just you know, hadn't been able to see it before the earthquake occurred. And so that's just a classic example of how like the night sky is not part of the heritage and culture of a place with a lot of light pollution. Um, it's not to say we need more earthquakes, but if you can do more with your lighting, you can, you can recapture the sky. So we can, oh, sorry. So can we make a difference? Let me now, I appreciate all the questions that came in. Uh, so I, let me go ahead and address those before we talk about some ways that you can make a difference. Um, uh, what is the photo with all the birds in the background showing? Awesome, great, thanks. Um, that is a good question. Uh, let's go back to that. Um, those are birds, right? So those are birds that, um, the, that it wasn't a mass destruction of birds, but it was a place, I think this is, I, I, I think that this is an image of birds that are not alive. I, not, I do not believe that they were ne all necessarily killed through light pollution incidences, but I think it was just to show that there are, there are birds that die, um, hundreds of millions of birds that die every year, some of them uh, through light pollution issues. And then the other picture here is showing, uh, this picture on the left is definitely, definitely showing, it's kind of in the background, but you can see birds that are flying into a light polluted glare arrangement with a building down here that is being lit and not lit. And so it's just very easy to fly into the light and then to fly into objects that are not lit because of the lighting effects of that glare. Um, Patty has asked, with summer coming up, uh, when and where is the best place to see the Milky Way on the Central Coast? That's a great question, um, and we will, I'll come to that as well, so let's hold on to that uh, for the end of the talk. I wanted to show you a website about that. Um, and then, do you know of any local groups or organizations that promote dark skies here in Los Osos and San Luis Obispo County? How can we support that? Thanks, Corey. Um, I do know that the Central Coast Astronomical Society of which Tom Fry is a member um, and on this call, is very active in promoting uh, dark skies. Um, and that is one organization. I believe that there are, I believe that there are, there's an environmental science club, environmental club on Cal Poly's campus, and they are interested in this plus other environmental issues. Um, and anybody feel free to type into the chat if you know of other organizations, but definitely the Central Coast Astronomical Society would be one place to get more information about local efforts on the Central Coast. Awesome. How are we doing, Monica? We are good. Looks like that's all the questions in the Q&A. I was also told by one of our attendees that the chat is actually disabled. So if anyone wants to type anything and chat's not working, try Q&A. Awesome. Sorry about that. <laughs> No worries. All right, so um, let's just talk a little bit about ways that we can address this issue with some fairly simple solutions. Many of them just deal with better lighting designs. Um, it's uh, very well 
studied that um, having shielding on your lights, on, on your lighting fixtures, that have been designed to restrict the directionality of the lighting to be more downward facing as opposed to more omnidirectional will address many, many of the effects we've talked about in the last half hour. So again, this is a not well shielded light where light is able to be shined upwards up into the sky causing sky glow. It's being lit off into the distance causing glare. It's also, you know, very difficult to control the light. So it's causing light trespass. If you put a shield over that light um, or have a fixture that is already shielded and have the light being directed downwards, then you are not sending as much light, wasted light up into the sky. This is a picture of a non-shielded light um, building and then after shields been installed onto those light fixtures. You can retrofit existing lighting with just physical shields that go, they've been designed and built to go onto the fixture to, to block the light and to retract it down. And then you can also purchase new light fixtures that are already shielded. Um, and again, this is largely just about awareness. Like if you, if you are able to promote this in your community and you can have lighting ordinances and, and perspective that this is an important thing, then it, it can cost a little bit more money for these types of fixtures, but you actually can save that money by, by needing fewer. If you have, if you're directing the light in thoughtful ways, you can actually have fewer lights, more properly lighting an environment and therefore using less electricity over the long run. Um, in the next slide, uh, it is actually also the case that different colors of light correlate to different um, spectrum temperatures. Uh, warmer lights, warmer light sources are more on the blue end of the spectrum and cooler lights are more in the red end of the spectrum. Um, and so this is called the color correlated, the color that the color temperature. Um, as we talked about in terms of like melatonin levels and human health issues, blue light is a very, very, it's not, it's not a normal lighting color in the nighttime. And so we are not adapted to have lots of blue light, lots of high temperature high color temperature light sources in the nighttime. And so having nighttime light fixtures that are, that are lower, uh, lower color temperature and more in the whites and the reds are more natural for the types of lighting that you would see at a campfire or in a nighttime scene. And so having lower color temperature light, light fixtures is important. Part of this goes into what Tom was asking about, about LEDs. Um, LEDs are, are well, they're, they're now LEDs that can be tuned to different colors. And so you can definitely get LEDs that are going to be at lower color temperatures. But the, the, first, the first generations of LEDs were actually all really, really bright and in the whites and blues. And so you get all of these really, really bright whites and blues that are in a lighted environment um, and are, are very difficult from a health perspective for humans. Um, Again, so it's just about being, when you buy an LED, it's useful to look at the color temperature that you're buying and going so something that's below 3000 degrees Kelvin is what's recommended um, for health purposes. Uh, additionally, you can have city ordinances that address, address both the intensity of how bright your lights can be in public and private spaces, and then also the number of lights that you can have. And so this is a clearly well lit area. Uh, and you can, if, yeah, but and, and but there, this is a clearly set up system where they have decided to better light the roads, but not light the communities as much. So you can see clearly this is a darker part of this of the city ordinances where they've intentionally made these regions darker, and they've decided to light up the roadway. Um, and I believe there's actually not a lot of glare in this picture coming up. Right, there's a lot of these a lot of these lights have been directed downwards because this is where you want the light, is on the street where the cars are. You don't want the light and the glare in the community and residence. So that's city planning work. Um, and then you can have lighting ordinances. That um, Boulder passed a lighting ordinance in 2002 that is finally coming into effect now in 2020. So they passed an ordinance that said, okay, we're making this advisory until 2020, but in 18 years, you should be ready to be more thoughtful about your lighting. And so um, builders now, contractors now, are not allowed to put certain fixtures and certain lighting types of um, fixtures into, the, into new installations. 
Um, and, and there's a self-report option that if, you have a, if you, you're in a neighborhood where light trespass is an issue, you can report that. They don't actually, in that ordinance, they don't actually have a good way of enforcing that, but you can go tell your neighbors, um, can you help me out here? Skies are important. Um, and so passing ordinances is another, another effort towards that space. Um, Tom, I don't know if I addressed all of your LED questions. Um, the, I guess, but again, again, one of the things about LEDs is that you do have more control over the color temperature if you, if you get the right type of LED. Um, but, it, but there have been many communities that have had, they got, people got really excited about LEDs. Uh, I mean, LEDs are great from a, they're particularly good from a energy conservation perspective because they're using way less electricity to generate more light. They're much less wasteful from a, from a thermal output perspective. And so you have, you're saving electricity costs and therefore saving fossil fuel burning carbon footprint issues. Um, but if you don't actually shield your LED from a light pollution issue, issue it can be just as bad. Uh, one of our communities in Sisters, Oregon, the, the, the city was very excited to be putting in their new street lighting system and because they were getting all LED installations in the city of Sisters. But, um, but when, and that was gonna be significant from an energy savings perspective, but they neglected to put any shielding on any of that and any of those street lights. And so when you drive through Sisters now, the entire city is just like sky glow from, from several miles away as you approach Sisters. And so shielded LEDs are really important compared to non-shielded. Um, well, any non-shielded light. Um, lastly, Scott has asked, the Beauty Cambria Association has been working for four years to update lighting codes. Awesome, thanks Scott, that's really great to know, um, to get Cambria to design as an, designated as an international dark sky community. Right, that is another, that's another last piece is that there are dark sky communities and dark sky regional parks and dark sky areas all over the Western United States that, um, that are is another approach to help um, increase the awareness of your city as being uh, more of a conservationist location for protecting dark skies. Um, one of my favorite places is in Tonopah, Nevada, which claims of having, which has a claim of having the brightest dark skies in the nation, uh, because they're very proud of their dark skies and just how bright the actual Milky Way and the bright the stars are because they have dealt with their light pollution issues. Um, to deal with that, um, this last this last piece is where to find this lighting. Um, the IDA, the Dark Sky Association, has created a fixture seal of approval program that some hardware stores and well, some lighting designers are using. So you can also, when you go to Home Depot um, or to Lowe's to buy lighting sources, you can get um, IDA approved lighting fixtures that have been designed with this in mind. Uh, it's also another, like one of the lighting ordinances in um, Boulder County is to, you're allowed to have lighting that will trespass your property, but it has to be on a timer, it has to be on a sensor, on a motion sensor. And so you're only allowed to have that light turn on if there's motion that is a indicator that potentially you need a light shining in the direction. And then it has to be set so that it then goes off if that was just a rabbit or an animal walking by, which is the most common thing that would cause the light to go off. And so being thoughtful about having time, motion sensor lighting versus lighting that is on continuously is another approach. Um, I just wanted, I'm gonna finish my slides here and go back to the last part of my presentation. I just wanted to give credit again to the IDA, um, International Dark Sky Association, which one, gave us these slides, and two, has been active for at least the last 40 years in terms of trying to promote awareness of light pollution as an issue and has lots and lots of resources at their webpage um, that I'd encourage you to go check out if you are, if you haven't already, or if you would like to after this talk. Um, so then just to wrap up my part, oh, it's already 4.55. Monica, you didn't tell me that. I didn't know it was only five minutes left. <laughs> Everyone's so engaged. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, though what I wanted to finish with was just, there was a question that was asked about where the best places are to see dark skies uh, on the central coast. Um, I was doing some research and preparing for this talk and I just wanted to show you, give a shout out to Brady Cabe. Uh, if you're on this call, good job, Brady. Um, this is just a nice web page that shows how and where to view the Milky Way in San Luis Obispo County. Um, and Kibiti is selling these pictures, but there are lots and lots of nice pictures here of, of you know, piers along the central coast and shots of the Milky Way and sky glare, like there's glare from this light source, but being out on the coast away from lights is good. Um, look at that, I mean, I, I, I've been promoting how great the, the community is, but there is still sky glow, right? There's still sky glow here in Pismo Beach and other parts of the central coast. And so getting away from just, just basically getting away from wherever you see more lights is going to be better for taking those shots. Um, this is this picture was taken in Lopez Drive, heading east during a meteor shower. Um, so this is a time lapse photograph that's showing meteors coming from one direction of the sky, um, and it's a time lapse photograph showing the directionality of the of the radiant for that meteor shower of these shooting stars. Uh, this, you know, nice shot of stars, still some sky glow off in the distance. Um, you can do lots of cool stuff with astrophotography where you can like, clearly uh, Brady has lit, lit up the background here with a flashlight or with a moon, or probably with a flashlight. So during this time, that picture, you can light up the scene and then turn off the light and then capture the rest of the night sky um, from the Milky Way. Um, again, although you do want to get away from Pismo. Uh, and so just various shots here taken from sand dunes on down south of San Luis Obispo down by Santa Maria and other locations. I know that the Central Coast Astronomical Society has designated locations that if you're a club member or even a, a member of the public for their public viewing nights, you can go to darker sky locations. You don't want to be in places where glare is an issue. And so it's um, just a matter of driving around or bicycling around to get away from the light pollution areas uh, and to get into places where you have darker skies. I will add that there is one, like we've been talking a lot about light pollution. One of the reasons why, one of the negative parts of being on the Central Coast is just that clearly the, mar the marine layer is a much more common phenomenon. And so while I've been not styling on the, um, the brightness of Denver off in the horizon where I live, I have been appreciating the fact that it doesn't get foggy every morning in, in Boulder. Um, and so I do now get to see, you know, Jupiter and Saturn up in the sky right now every morning and stars up until late in the night. Um, interestingly, I notice a difference of the light pollution in the evening when more businesses are active. And then after businesses have all closed at seven, nine, 11 or two in the morning, and you go outside at three or four in the morning and you're looking at the sky and you get a darker sky because there are less, there's less commercial activity and less people around and people have turned off their lights. So again, that's just, you know, you, we can affect this by the choices we make with regards to the lighting that we're using. Um, in my last minute, I have one more question. Is that true, Monica? Yes. And we are um, not confined to one hour. So if people want to stay, if you want to stay, we're welcome to go over, but it's totally up to you. If you want to leave contact info, if people have additional questions, you can do that as well. Sure. Yeah, so anonymous attendee, um, have you come across any light shields that are easily adaptable to many existing designs of fixtures already in place? Um, I have, I, I mean, it, I, I have, I have not, I have not, because I, but I also haven't, to be fair, I haven't done enough of that research. Um, if anybody on this call has things to add, feel free to throw that in there. I, I was, we were used to be working in a place called Astro Camp, which was, it has Astro in its name, right? It's a camp for kids to come look at the sky in Idlewild. And I showed up there from graduate school and they had all of these huge halogen light sources that were unshielded all over the camp. And I was like, what? <laughs> we can't call ourselves Astro Camp if we're shining all this light all over the place. And so we, it was pretty, it was a pretty straightforward deal of, of looking up the lighting fixtures that they had installed in the parking lot, 
looking online and there was already product that had been specially designed for that specific type of light fixture. And within three days we got them shipped and within five days our maintenance staff had gone up and had simply screwed them into the place and then the entire camp felt different because that shield was stopping that light uh, trespass. Um, there are probably other more gen there are probably some generic light shields that have been designed to try to adopt and accommodate the most lighting fixtures, but I'm pretty sure it will still be an issue of like understanding what fixture you're trying to address and then working either on the web or at a, at a, at a, um, at a uh, hardware store to identify the right shield for you. Um, that's another way you can be active. You can actually go to your local hardware store and just ask them to show you, them, show you their lighting display and then point out those lighting fixtures that are IDA approved and ask if they'll be more willing to promote those types of lights and those types of light sources than other ones um, in, their, in, their, in their actual commercial store. Um, have you used the loss of the night app um, for phones? Um, yeah, so they're actually the very good cell phone apps that will let you um, that will let you look at the night sky and measure and use your phone as a light meter as opposed to buying a light meter um, that will measure brightness. I have not used the Loss of the Night app myself, but there's a great movie called Loss of the Night uh, that is that I have used in the planetarium that I run. Um, so Chandra, I, I sorry I haven't I haven't used it, but I've heard about that app, and I know that cell phones can be used for like pollution measurements as well. Um, let's see. So, uh, yeah, I guess just to wrap up, um, I, I do hope that this was helpful, um, in terms of just awareness about light pollution. Uh, I am also, I want to be clear, like I am, I am not, I have not been, I, I have always followed IDA and I worked closely with Connie Walker when I was in Tucson. Um, she, she was the president has was, was the president of the IDA for 10 or 15 years um uh there are many people who are way more expert than i am on this topic uh particularly uh university of utah in salt lake city has created an entire an entire major on dark skies they have an entire major that you can study dark skies environmentalism um just from a cultural medical health astronomy that whole perspective of like all of the ways that dark skies and not dark skies are an important part of the human experience. Um, and so uh, I definitely encourage you if this has been interesting to reach out to the Central Coast Astronomical Society, uh, go to the International Dark Sky Association or Glo Globe at Night. Um, I will share my, I'll share my contact information uh, and I'm happy to talk more, but again, I, I just was grateful for the opportunity to share the limited knowledge I have, um, but and and then I but I'm happy to also to point you to other places that have even more information.